May we be upstanding for the national anthem. May we remain standing as I invite our senior economist, Dr. Epo Shimba, to give us a prayer. Uh, let us pray, shall we? Our Father and our God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, hallowed be your name this morning. Hallowed be your name in this place, mighty God. We ask Heavenly Father for your favor upon this monetary policy announcement and press briefing. Your word says and we believe that a horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory comes from the Lord. And that to plan is in the heart of man but it's the Lord that establishes his steps. In the same vein, Father God, we bring this monetary policy stance that we have prepared and ask that, Father God, you command a blessing on it, that we'll be victorious in the plans that we have made as men. I pray, Heavenly Father, for senior management, the governor, I speak your favor upon him, that he, as he makes this announcement and the press briefing, that Lord, you bless him with wisdom in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Governor, Deputy Governors, members of the Monetary Policy Committee, members of the press, Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I would like to welcome you to our fourth monetary policy media briefing for the year. As you may be aware, the monetary policy committee was holding its meeting over the past two days, November 16th and 17th, and we are here today to hear the decision of the committee. Allow me to acknowledge also the presence of our online audience who are following us through various channels, as you may already be aware, we are live on ZNBC TV One. We are also live on our Facebook page, the ZNBC Facebook page as well. To those that are following us through our social media platforms, we welcome you and we appreciate your presence. Allow me to introduce the dignitaries in the house this morning. In our midst, we have our new governor, Mr. Christopher Mvunga, who will be making his first MPC announcement. The governor is the gentleman in the middle of the table, and I know he's someone that you, he, who does not need any introduction as you already know him. He is flanked by his two deputies, deputy governor in charge of operations, Dr. Francis Chpimo on his right, and deputy governor in charge of administration, Mrs. Reka Mohango on his left. I am your master of ceremony. My name is Besnat Mwanza, acting assistant director in charge of communications. Without wasting much of your time, I will at this point in time invite the governor to address the media. Governor, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Masters of Ceremony. 
and uh, thank you to all of you for coming through. Uh, before I begin my address, as I was walking through to this hall, I've been elated that there's a media, social media report that's talking about banning of foreign bank accounts in Zambia. And I just want to reassure all Zambians that the Bank of Zambia, neither the Minister of Finance, is working on any such uh, initiative to stop CFC accounts. So whatever you're reading on social media, please dismiss it with the contempt it deserves. And I also hasten to say to all Zambians that it, it's events like these that tarnish the image of the nation, both locally and abroad, and send up, ending up sending wrong signals. And uh, financial markets are very sensitive markets, and we should be hyper careful in the sense in which we play social media games with the financial markets. Because financial market stability is a key cornerstone to any economy to thrive in the world. So let's just be mindful about that. And uh, for those that have read it, I know the Bankers Association of Zambia president called me a few minutes ago. So I wish to dismiss with the concept it deserves and the serious concept it deserves that whatever is circulating is actually false news. So with that, let's commence with our program. May I take this opportunity to recognize the presence of a Deputy Governor Operations, Dr. Francis Chipimo. On my left, I've got Deputy Governor Administration, uh, Rekam Hango. I've got directors present here for every department within the bank. May I also take this opportunity to recognize the bank colleagues from Bank of Zambia, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. Members of the media, may I take this opportunity to welcome you to this press briefing on the deliberations of the Monetary Policy Committee, which took place on 16 and 17th November 2020. I sincerely express my thanks as the Bank of Zambia for making yourselves available this morning to this important briefing. As this is my first MPC address as governor, let me start by thanking His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Zambia, Dr. Edgar Chagwalungu, for giving me this rare opportunity to save as governor of the Bank of Zambia. Allow me also at this juncture to thank my predecessor, Dr. Denny Kalielie, for his contribution to the fulfillment of the Bank of Zambia's mandate during the time he served as governor. I also wish to thank my colleagues at the Bank of Zambia who have worked tirelessly over the last two days, spending long nights to facilitate this monetary policy committee briefing. Let me now turn to the business, substantive business of the day and brief you on the decision of the Monetary Policy Committee, which deliberated on economic developments in the third quarter and outlook for inflation and growth over the next, next eight quarters. The first item that we'll touch on the agenda is, as you are aware, we did have a, the, the Bank of Zambia had a Monetary Policy Committee meeting uh, in August. So I just want to look at what were the decisions made at that meeting their intended objectives, and where are we with those decisions. So I'll review the last Monetary Policy Committee decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may recall that in the last two sittings, the committee reduced policy rate by 225 basis points. For simplicity, that's 2.25 percent in May 2020, and a further 125 basis points in August 2020 bringing the monetary policy rate to 8%, which is the current rate, subject to the decisions that this committee has made. This brings the cumulative reduction to 350 basis points in 2020. For those of you that are familiar with our monetary policy functions in other countries, you will realize that this is quite a huge um, reduction in the policy rate. And it simply means that there is something that we're trying to achieve or there's something that we have observed in the market that needs these, such, such a huge reduction in the policy rate to be implemented. These decisions were necessary to safeguard the stability of the financial sector and to mitigate the adverse effects of COVID-19 pandemic on people's lives and livelihoods. Following these policy rate cuts, we have observed a decline in lending rates and moderate pickup in private sector credit. 
This has been supported by the increase in liquidity levels in the market through the stimulus measures implemented by the Bank of Zambia. The measures are the secondary market bond purchase program, which the Bank of Zambia embarked on, targeted medium term refinancing facility, which is commonly referred to, which you know as a 10 billion quarter facility, and open market operations undertaken on flexible terms. In addition, government measures to provide liquidity to the economy through the dismantling of domestic areas complemented our efforts. Recent developments and outlook. Let's look at what is happening at the global economy because we are, we are in a global village where we're part of, part of that village and what happens elsewhere has a direct or indirect impact on ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, global economic activity is showing signs of recovery as the economy is partially reopened and policy stimulus measures begin to take effect. In this regard, a less severe contraction of 4.4% is projected in 2020 than the earlier projection of 4.9%. A strong rebound in global growth is projected in 2021, supported largely by policy stimulus measures. The recovery is still expected to be protracted and highly uncertain over the medium term due to the impact of income losses on aggregate demand, rising sovereign debt and subdued commodity prices. Further, the risks to global growth remain tilted to the downside due to the high degree of uncertainty surrounding the evolution of the pandemic as well as the speed of delivering a vaccine. I think uh, you, you, if you've been following the developments in the, in the Western world, you will see that given, given the winter fall, there is a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen, the evolution of COVID-19, as the cases are beginning to increase again. So there's uncertainty about the second wave, third wave, and what the impact will be on the global economy. Let's turn to Zambia, domestic economic activity. High frequency data and coincident indicators of economic activity point to some improvement in the third quarter, reflecting the partial relaxation of COVID-19 restrictions. We have noted that business conditions and COVID confidence are improving as indicated by the Bank of Zambia survey and the, St the Stanbic Bank Purchasing Managers Index. Nonetheless, for 2020 as a whole, the economy is projected to contract by 4.2%. The observed better performance in mining production in the year to September may moderate the severity of the contraction. Over the medium term, growth is expected to recover a bit at a weaker pace than early anticipated due to limited fiscal space, as well as uncertainty surrounding the persistence of the COVID-19 pandemic and access to external financing. Let me turn to the economic, to the inflation outlook. After rising steadily for six successive quarters, annual overall infl inflation decelerated to an average of 15.7% in the third quarter from 16.1% in the preceding quarter. This was mainly due to improved supply of maize grain and related products. On account of this, food inflation declined to 15.2% from 16.9%. However, non-food inflation rose to 16.2% from 15.1% largely due to the depreciation of the kwacha. The recent reading of inflation points to a resurgence in inflationary pressures. In October, inflation rose to 16% from 15.7% in September, largely reflecting the weakening of the kwacha. Over the next eight quarters, which is a future outlook, we anticipate a moderation in inflationary pressures, although inflation is likely to persist above 6.8% target range throughout the forecast horizon. Inflation is forecast to average 16.7% in the fourth quarter of 2020. In 2021, it is expected to decline to 13.5% and further to about 10% in 2022 on an annual average basis. 
The factors underlying the decline in the projected in inflation include subdued aggregate demand and moderation in food prices, as well as money supply growth. However, risks to the inf inflation outlook are tilted to the upside, and these include higher than anticipated monetary expansion, possible upward adjustment in fuel prices, further deterioration of the fiscal position, as well as, it, as the depreciation of the quarter. Inflation may, however, decelerate faster if the measures being taken by government to restructure debt and implement key structural reforms materialize. Let me turn to the overnight interbank lending rate. Ladies and gentlemen, the overnight bank rate, interbank rate, which is our operational target, declined to a quarterly average of 9% from 11% and was maintained within the policy rate corridor of 7% to 9% throughout the quarter. The decline in the interbank rate was consistent with the policy rate cut in August and the liquidity support measures taken by the bank, which I alluded to earlier. Sufficient liquidity has continued to characterize the interbank market and has kept the interbank rate around the policy rate. So we're range bound and we're quite happy with that at the moment. Let me turn to government securities market. Following the increase in liquidity levels, demand for government securities remained strong. In particular, demand for treasury bills was much stronger as the auctions attracted bids in excess of amounts on offer by 54%. In contrast, government bond auctions were undersubscribed as the bid amounts fell short by 40%. However, this was an improvement over the 60% shortfall recorded during the previous quarter. Demand for government bonds has been relatively weak due in part to investors' expectation of high levels of short-term interest rates over the next few quarters. With increased re demand for treasury bills, funds raised from the auctions significantly increased, resulting in a surplus of 6.4 billion kwacha. As a result, the stock of the government securities grew by 15.8% to 118 billion kwacha. Let's look at interest rates and uh, what is the story behind that. Generally, the market interest rates maintained a downward trend, largely reflecting the accommodative monetary policy stance that the Bank of Zambia has undertaken. The commercial bank's average lending rate declined to 25.7% in September from 26.4% in June and further to 25% in October. The savings rate for 180-day deposits also reduced to 10.3% from 10.7% and is currently at 9.9%. Similarly, the composite yield rate, the composite yield rate on treasury bills declined to 22.7% from 26.3%. The composite government bond yield rate marginally increased to 2.3% from 31.8%. Let me turn to domestic credit and money supply. Credit growth to the private sector picked up slightly, 13.8% year on year, in September from 10.4% in June. This was largely attributed to the, to the sustained increase in demand for bridge financing and work, working capital by firms to meet rising operating costs. However, government continued to expand at a, at government credit ex, a, continued to expand at a faster pace, growing by 69.2% in September compared to 46.9% in June. In line with the expansion in domestic credit, money supply growth rose by 46.5% from 29.54%. Now, if you look at what I've said so far, and to bring it back to my initial remarks on, let's review what, what, the, policy, what the monetary policy measures were at the last sitting, you will see that we're heading towards achieving the intended, uh, the intended targets, which was uh, stabilizing the inflation, 
trying to reduce the, the interest rates and creating some form of stability in, on the overall market. So whilst we've done we've, there's achievements that we've, we've made, our review still indicates that there's still more to be done. We are on the right track. We, are not yet, we haven't arrived yet. So this sitting of monetary policy is actually a build-up on what happened in August and seeing exactly where we are currently and what other measures do we need to put in place in order to move the economy forward and create financial stability. Let's go to the uh, fiscal performance. Fiscal pressures heightened as the financing gap widened. Spending pressures escalated amidst declining domestic revenue. And I think if you've listened to the uh, briefings that the Minister of Finance has given, you will see that uh, both tax and non-tax revenue has been on the decline, mainly attributable to the impact of COVID and the slowdown in uh, business activities, the disruptions in logistics in terms of supply of goods and services. And uh, so that's consistent with what, uh, what, the, what the Minister of Finance has issued. Going forward, uncertainty is regarding the evolution of COVID-19 pandemic, debt suspension and restructuring, as well as securing external financing, will continue to exert pressures on the fiscal position. In this regard, successfully navigating the debt restructuring process to restore debt sustainability and implementing fiscal and other structural reforms are critical to return to fiscal fitness and microeconomic stability. You will appreciate that microeconomic policy doesn't work in isolation. It needs to be complemented by the fiscal policy as well. And I, I think I'll repeat this. In this regard, successfully navigating the debt restructuring process to restore debt sustainability and implementing fiscal and other structural reforms are critical to return to fiscal fitness and macroeconomic stability. Let me now turn to the current account. Ladies and gentlemen, the current account surplus expanded to $602 million from $351 million in the second quarter, driven by net exports. Merchandise exports grew by 35% to $2.3 billion due to higher earnings from copper and non-traditional exports. Copper earnings increased by 41% to US dollar 1.7 billion as export volumes expanded and realized prices rose. Non-traditional exports at $600 million were 51% higher, driven by seasonal peak pickup in agriculture exports such as barley tobacco, maize and maize seed, as well as cane sugar. Merchandise imports grew by 20% to $1.2 billion supported by the easing of COVID-19 restrictions and a gradual pickup in the domestic economic activity. The most topical item at the moment, let me turn to foreign exchange market, which I'm sure everyone wants to hear what is happening. In the foreign exchange market, the kwacha has continued to depreciate against the major currencies, although the pace was slower in the third quarter. The moderation in the pace of depreciation was mainly on account of increased interventions by the Bank of Zambia. Against the US dollar, the quarter weakened by slightly over 3% to average 18.94% sorry, 94 quarter per US dollar in the third quarter. And I'm sure you ask a question, but it's somewhere else. I'm now reporting on quarter by quarter, so just be mindful that I'm not talking about where it is today but we will talk about that. Currently, subdued foreign exchange supply amidst increased demand has continued to underlie the market. And that's a critical reason why we're having this depreciation happening. And I'll repeat that again. Currently, subdued foreign exchange supply amidst increased demand has continued to underlie the market. And you can understand why it's a supply issue more than the demand issue, although it's a combination of both. Because what has happened is that because of a slowdown in the global economy, because of the recession globally, you would expect that the anticipated economic activities that bring dollar inflows into the country have been impacted in one way or the other. So the inflows of Forex are not at the rate that they've been previously. And consequently, when you hit that with the demand, there is pressure on the quarter. 
the reduction in the, in the reduction in the supply of foreign exchange to the market is partly due to the slowdown in global economic activity, which has adversely affected capital inflows. Heightened demand for foreign exchange is mainly for the importation of agriculture inputs and petroleum products. With limited supply, the Bank of Zambia has increased its intervention in order to support the market. Let me go to gross international reserves. With increased net foreign exchange sales for market support, coupled with debt service, gross international reserves declined by $112 million to $1.3 billion, billion, equivalent to 2.3 months of import cover. At the end of September, from $1.4 billion at the end of June, equivalent to 2.3 months import cover as well. Despite the decline in the level of reserves, and I think we need to take note of the magnitude of the decline, that it's only by $112 million from $1.3 billion to $1.4 billion. So I think we have preserved the reserves to some extent. Despite the decline in the level of reserves, the months of import cover remained unchanged due to the drop in imports of goods and services attributed to subdued economic activity and the depreciation of the quacha. Having looked at all these things, which the Monetary Policy Committee had to deliberate on, the Monetary Policy Committee was basically looking at what are the three decisions that we can make. Having digested all the information that was available to us and the analysis we've undertaken, the scanning of the global market, the scanning of the uh, domestic market, uh, the impact of COVID, and where inflation sits at the moment. So we had three options, and I'll go through these options as I present. From the foregoing, it is noted that imbalances in the economy still exist. In particular, inflationary pressures have persisted. Growth is anemic, and fragilities in the financial sector have not abated. Uncertainty surrounding the persistence of COVID-19 pandemic and access to external financing remain key downside risks to growth prospects. This requires that we strike a balance, the right balance between price and financial system stability and economic growth. Not exactly an easy task to undertake, but those are the things that we have to uh, analyze in order to arrive at the right decision. With these developments, the Monetary Policy Committee considered three options. One, to raise the monetary policy rate, two, to reduce, <clears throat> to reduce the monetary policy rate, or three, to maintain the monetary policy rate. And I guess that's why we're meeting here to give you the decision that the Monetary Policy Committee has arrived at after taking into account the background that I've given you. With these developments, the MPC considered three options which I've just gone through. And the first option was, with inflation on the rise, conventional wisdom would dictate that with rising inflation, the policy rate in an effort to control inflation would have been expected to increase. However, doing so under the circumstances, and in these unconventional circumstances with, with a COVID-19 pandemic impact, slow, slow growth in the economy, contraction in businesses, in an already depressed economic situation would result in further contraction in economic activity and threaten the stability of the financial sector. So this option was discounted by the Monetary Policy Committee. Ideally, in a normal traditional environment, you'd expect that when inflation is rising, the central bank will increase the monetary policy rate to contract, uh, to stand out demand so that you reduce the, in the inflation. However, as I, I've just read, it's a very difficult scenario because the impact of that is that the businesses which are already distressed will actually become worse, and that will lead to contraction in the economic activity, which will subsequently lead to contraction in your GDP growth. So that is why we discounted that, that, uh, that option. The other option we had, on the other hand, was reducing the policy rate in an attempt to give further support to the economy and put 
which may put additional pressure on the exchange rate in a supply constrained environment. I did allude to the fact that uh, the inflows are, uh, the supply side of the forex is on the decline or it's constrained because of, uh, because of a global impact of COVID and uh, businesses contracting. So what it meant is that if we reduce the policy rate, what was going to happen is that the demand will go up in terms of access to credit and people seeking more dollars, and that was going to put further pressure on the exchange rate. So this option was also discounted. And I think having discounted the two, you can conclude or deduce which option we've arrived at. So considering all these factors, and including significant reduction in the policy rate by 350 basis points that we did in August and May, May and August uh, 2020, we also need to allow the decisions that we've made in the past to pass through the economy so we can actually see exactly where we are. So far, it looks like we're in the right projectile, and therefore we need to give it more, more time and space for these things to pan out. So the monetary policy decided to maintain the, exchange, the monetary policy rate at 8%, so there's been no change in the policy rate. I think that is the key decision that you wanted to hear, and I wish to hasten to say, as a closing remark, that decisions on future policy rate will be guided by inflation focus, outcomes, and identified risks, including those associated with financial stability and COVID-19 pandemic. And let me emphasize, it's highly uncertain that we can predict the extent to which COVID-19 will impact the economy because we're impacted two ways, locally in terms of livelihoods and losing lives and uh, saving livelihoods. Internationally, what is happening impacts us in terms of uh, the trade between uh, the trading partners and our country. So we're still in uncharted waters and we're monitoring the situation closely and the Bank of Zambia will respond accordingly in future given what the developments will be going forward. And once there's greater certainty, as to where we are. I thank you all and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor. So there we have it. Monetary policy rate maintained at 8%. At this point, we will go into the question and answer session. Let me state, our colleagues, that the questions should be restricted to monetary policy issues. We did receive a number of pre-briefing questions from some of you, and they were broad-based. Governor will soon have an interaction with yourselves where questions dealing with other issues pertaining to the general operations of the bank will be dealt with. So for now, let's restrict ourselves to monetary policy issues. We will take three questions at a time, and those who want to ask questions will have to walk to the microphone that has been set up for this um, session. Please state your name, state the institution where you are coming from before you ask your question. My name is Chris Infla, I write for Reuters News Agency. I wanted to find out, Governor, how does the, the default by the Zambian government impact on monetary policy and what measures uh, do you plan to put in place to mitigate this? Good morning, Governor. My name is Esther Mseteka, I'm from Millennium TV. I know you have uh, elaborated uh, very, very well on the issue to do with uh, the MPC rate. And uh, my question is still insisting on the same. I just wanted to find out how you continue defending the local currents to prevent it from, fa from further decline. And um, if, uh, to prevent it from further decline, if no, why not? If yes, if you continue to defend it, which, uh, what strategies are you putting in place and for how long will it take you to, to make it uh, hold strength? Thank you. We can take the last question in this round. Yes. Um, thank you so much. Good, I don't know if it's afternoon yet or so morning. Um, congratulations on your appointment, Governor. Um, my name is Esna Lungu from Spring TV. So my question, um, or a question or two, with the current situation, does the central bank expect uh, its treasury bills and bond auction to be attractive in the short term? Um, secondly, um, may I also just ask about the progress? Um, your predecessor, Dr. Denny Kalyalia, 
talked about repaying China's debt in renminbi. Are you proceeding with the same? And then, what is the update on the gold reserves in the central bank? Because this might, I think, also add to the solution in the country's um, economic, current economic situation. Lastly, Mr. Governor, the pandemic payment holiday offered to businesses and, and individuals has contributed highly to global current debt crisis. We're looking at amounts skyrocketing to about 1.4 trillion pounds in Europe alone due to COVID-19. If developed nations are encountering such difficulties, where do we stand as Zambians and with banks and lending institutions? Thank you. That was a mouthful, Esnat. She took the liberty to ask four questions. Governor, you may respond. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, Chris and Fuller Reuters. Uh, default on loan payment, what measures is the Bank of Zambia putting in place? I think we just need to put context to this issue of, uh, of the default. It is generally agreed that the impact of COVID has destabilized economies worldwide, not just in Zambia. And that's why we're talking about reduction in inflows of foreign exchange, reduction in government revenues from both tax and non-tax revenues, Increased expenditure arising from need to save lives, so your health budgets have gone up. Other emergency funding has had to come into. One of the roles of the central bank is actually to provide unconventional emergency funding in situations where the economy gets shocks, which were not anticipated. So with result to the COVID, there's a general consensus worldwide that for countries that have got severe debt, and which has now been compounded by, by the COVID crisis, that there should be a DSSI, which has been initiated by the G20, the Debt Suspension Initiative, Debt Service Suspension Initiative. And what this is meant to do is to give you breathing space from the fiscal point of view, because you've got subdued revenues and increased expenditure. So you've got pressure on your fiscal, on your fiscal and that's why the funding gap is widening. Now, part of the funding from the, from the government side is debt service. So what we are saying is that if you give us relief for the next six months, and hopefully I think the G20 has approved the further six months, or they're deliberating regarding another six months, it gives you breathing space in which you, we can reorganize ourselves and better plan and manage this uh, uh, unconventional situation we're in. What that means is that to do that, one of the conditions is that all creditors have to be treated equally or equitably, which means I cannot pay one creditor and I'm not paying the other one, because then that's not equitable. So the default in itself has got, that's, that's the background or the genesis of the default we're talking about. It's not that we could not pay, it says that if we pay one creditor, then we need to pay all the creditors. So the decision that was undertaken, which was a conscious decision, is that we would not pay any of the creditors and would treat all of them equally with a view that we will come up with a constructive, uh, progressive, forward-looking plan on our debt sustainability, which will allow us in the future to meet all our credit obligations. So that's the genesis of the matter, and that's where we're coming from. So in terms of what measures we're putting in place, the Minister of Finance is in, uh, is at, is in uh, discussions with all the creditors to try and see what they can do regarding debt restructuring, regarding uh, easing off in terms of uh, the existing ob obligations, arrears. And so far, I think we've seen some positive actions coming through. Just the other day, China Exim Bank gave us uh, a DSSI relief of $110 million. And progressively, if we can achieve these milestones, then we'll be better placed as a country to, to sustain our debt issues. So I hope, Chris, I've answered you in that regard. Uh, Estam Seteka, local currency depreciation, what strategies and how long? I think I did, I did indicate in my opening remarks and in my address that we're living in a very uncertain times. It's very difficult to predict to what extent uh, the pandemic, the devastation of the pandemic will have on both domestic and global economy. So we can only hope that it gets better and all I can urge is that to help us as well Please observe the health guidelines of mask up, social distancing, because the minute we can control this, which we are part of the people that can help us control it, then we can start having sight of where this, this pandemic is going to. 
With regard to local currency depreciation, I did allude in my presentation that the Bank of Zambia has had to provide support to the market, which has progressively increased. And I did allude to the fact that as a result of the Bank of Zambia interventions, the, the depreciation, the pace at which the quach has depreciated has to some extent been abated. Because if we didn't intervene, the situation could have been worse. So we will continue observing the markets. As a need arises, we will continue intervening in the markets until such times that the market hits equilibrium in terms of the supply and demand side. So it's an ongoing exercise. We monitor the conditions of the market on a weekly basis, if anything, on a daily basis, actually, at the end of every day, to see what the market conditions look like. And we're informed by what the market conditions look like to support the market and see that we attempt to at least slow down the, the, the depreciation of a quarter. Um, Esnat, Lungu, bond and treasury bills, are they attractive? I think, I think I did indicate in my presentation that we oversubscribed in treasury bills and that whilst we're not fully subscribed in government bonds, the quarter on quarter number is better than what it was in the previous quarter. So by and large, I think what I'm saying is that yes, they do remain attractive, and that's why we're the surplus. I think I did quote a figure of 605 million uh, surplus on the government security subscription. So they are attractive. Paying Chinese debt in Rumbi, which is RMB, that's a possibility, but it's an evolving, uh, it's an evolving, yes, I agree, at a strategy level, if we can, there's also Cyrus, the, the Southern Africa uh, regional integrated pay, electronic payment systems, which if you can pay in runs as opposed to, to dollars, and it works, so I'm urging the businesses, those that have got debt in, in, a, in RAND, there is already an existing platform where you can pay from Kwacha to RAND. You don't need to convert into dollar. Uh, similarly with Rumbis, when such an instrument is in place, it wouldn't hurt for us to pay our, our Chinese debt in Rumbi, because then we would have diversified our currency portfolio from currently where it is with just focusing on dollar. And I'm sure that would go a long way in easing the pressures on the dollar demand. Gold reserves, I think from a gold reserves point of view, that's one top priority agenda item for the Bank of Zambia. I will comment on it and I'll ask the, the, direct, the, the Deputy Governor Operations to comment as well. We are aggressively and intensify the discussions with the producers and suppliers of gold in terms of Bank of Zambia purchasing the, the gold from them. Uh, I think we've reached a very, very advanced stage We've already got draft contracts which we're going through, but I'll allow the, uh, the Deputy Governor Operations, who's heading the, the Bank of Zambia team in these conversations, to comment on that. I'll stop there and hand over to the Deputy Governor to comment on your gold and any other items that you may want to cover. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Governor. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I think on the gold reserve, so I think as we've indicated before, there are two tracks. The first has been with uh, one of the major mining companies. We are just in the process of finalizing that uh, contract we've exchanged, as Governor has said, and um, we just need to iron out uh, the, the, our positions, uh, the two positions. So I think we'll be having those discussions uh, this week and we'll see, hopefully we can get some conclusion. The other track, though, is with uh, ZCCMIH and is more with the ability to purchase gold locally. Here again, we've exchanged the contracts now and we're having discussions with them. On our side, we're also putting in place the necessary measures which we need to have in terms of security, storage, how you refine it, and how you store it. So those um, efforts which we're making are now actually quite 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 uh, well advanced so we're hoping we can actually make some some good progress uh, uh, with the, the ccmih as well <coughs> um the other point governor perhaps i needed to provide some clarification i think esnat's point on Remimbi and china i think it's important to remember at the back of all of this is really about trade um, and if you look at the big payments which are made relating to government debt so very much moving on this would 
really anchor on uh, the government policy and negotiations which they're able to make. I think in previous meetings we had mentioned the fact that the central bank uh, had already entered into discussions uh, to have swap lines with the uh, central, the PBOC. Um, but these are really aimed at supporting trade uh, locally between China and Zambia. And they will be tied with really the government policy on, 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 on debt and trade as well. I think um, that was, was the two. And do you want to comment further on the foreign exchange? Um, the, the, the forex market, I think the key issue perhaps just to, to give some background, um, I think what indicated before, we had begun, in order to shore up reserves, we had begun to purchase foreign exchange from the mines. First it was just the mineral royalties and then in June this year we began to also uh, receive the foreign exchange component of other tax payments. And I think when we moved to this system, it was always understood that it would enable us to build reserves, but if we got into a situation where the market had difficulties, that we could use that same resource to support the market. And that effectively is really what we've been doing and the governor saying we're able to provide support to the market. What we get from the mines, now we're able to put back to the market. During this period where we've seen that supply is particularly uh, low. So it's important to, to understand that because that is really what has provided a defense against us running down reserves significant. Because again, that is a problem. Uh, a reasonable level of reserves is important <coughs> for confidence. It's important for us to be able to deal with shocks, which, which may come. Um, can we go to the second round? Any other questions coming through? Hello, Esther again. I thought uh, maybe you would restrict us to one question uh, each. So I still have uh, more questions to ask, uh, still on the MPC, uh, but trying to tilt a bit where we, you talked also about inflation. I uh, just wanted to find out if uh, BOZ may cave to political pressure and, to, and print money as we, um, as we move towards August 2021. My question is what guarantee can BOZ give the public that you do not resort to printing money? Then the other one is more of an institution. I just wanted to find out if a BOZ consider institution reforms to take on more long-term economic development policy orientation beyond the current short term. Uh, that is to, uh, for price uh, policy stability. Thank you. Good morning, Governor. Talga from Bloomberg. Um, will the central bank pay bondholders if they declare default and demand immediate repayment of the principal? Sorry, Tonga, just repeat that. Will the central bank pay uh, euro bond holders if they declare default and uh, demand the principal payment? Um, allow me to elaborate a bit further. Yes. Um, if they do um, take out action to warrant us to pay the principal amount, I hope that's clear. Okay. Mm. Thank you so much, Chota Prudence from Kami TV. Uh, Governor, I would like to find out uh, some, some businesses um, uh, that or the central bank uh, were affected by COVID-19. There were some businesses that owed, this, that owed the central bank even before the coming of the COVID-19. So the question that I would like to ask is, in as much as government is asking for relief from uh, uh, the, the people we owe money, have there been any consideration for businesses that have been owing the central bank? What relief have you given them? And then the other thing that I would like to find out is the central bank considering buying off some of the debt that uh, small businesses are uh, owing the central bank. Thank you. Can I just say clarity for myself? Are you referring to owing commercial banks or owing the central bank? Is it the commercial banks that you're referring to or the central bank? The businesses who owe money? The commercial banks. The, not the central bank. No. All right, the commercial banks owing the Bank of Zambia. So the, the question that I'm asking is, are there any relief that have been given during the period of the, the COVID-19? And does the central bank, are you considering also buying off some of the loans that these businesses owe you? Thank you. Governor, you may take those questions. Yes, please. Uh, let, me ask, uh, let me ask my deputy governor to tackle the case of the reforms on Bank of Zambia, and then I'll answer the rest. Thank you, Governor. I think the question, I'm not sure I quite got the, 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 
the point which has been raised, what I understand the question to be is, are we going to take on a more developmental role? Um, Esther, I don't know if that's the route you are going. Um, but if that is the case, I think the central bank remains committed to its primary objective of price and financial system stability. But I think as the governor has indicated, we are in really unprecedented times, and not just us, the whole economy. And so in these times, you have to sit and look at what are the challenges you face and how can you best support these. And so the central bank, in fact, has done really unconventional things it otherwise wouldn't have done. The facility to allow banks, for example, to have liquidity and to lend to others on more favorable terms through the TMTRF uh, with an interest rate now of 8%. This was something ordinarily we wouldn't do. Obviously, this facility, depending on how imaginative we are prepared to be, can actually help push the real economy. <coughs> and these are some of the issues which we're working on with the Bankers Association and other financial institutions to say, how can we make this facility more effective so that it supports the real economy? Because we know that if we support businesses, the banks will have better quality of assets, and that minimizes the risk of the financial system being in trouble. And we all know that if the financial system collapses, then everything else becomes challenging. So really, our development goals, even if you look at our mission statement, it sits within the context of, at the end of the day, monetary policy works with other fiscal policy and others to deliver develop, sustainable development and, and, and poverty reduction. But the key points will remain price financial system stability. And that really is what limits the extent to which we can reach outside of this mandate. We always have to come back to those two principles, even when we are looking to help the real economy. Let me come to this question on the printing of money. I think I've come across it several times, and at times I get confused myself as what exactly is being meant. Do I have a mint machine in my office where I run it and people collect the money in boxes? Anyway, one of the core functions of Bank of Zambia is to provide liquidity to the banking system to ensure that it continues to function effectively and support economic activity. The other thing that Bank of Zambia does is to, we, printing currency is based on economic demand so as to support commerce and trade. So those are the preconditions that we look at when we're looking at the supply of money in the country. I can now categorically tell you that elections or political events are not one of the determinants for Bank of Zambia to look at when considering the issue of increasing money supply or not. So to answer your question in short, an election event is not a trigger for printing of money by the Bank of Zambia. It's nowhere near the Bank of Zambia criteria. So we will not print money because of elections. Let me also make it very clear. One of the jobs of the central banks is to print money. And as I said, to support commerce and trade. So it needs to be backed by economic activity in order to increase money supply in the system. You don't just sit and print money where there's no opposing value or economic, or economic or productivity happening. To give you an example, when you bring in all these old notes that are torn and worn out, what do you want the bank to do? Don't we go and print the notes to replace the ones that you've, you've brought? That's printing money. And that's why I'm saying we should be careful when we're talking about printing money. Because there are no more operational activities of the Bank of Zambia, which involves increasing money supply. We did talk about the issue of the bank wants to see financial stability. So when there's no liquidity in the, in the banking system, the Bank of Zambia will lend money to the commercial banks to create liquidity in the system. So it's a role of the bank to ensure that there's sufficient liquidity at any given time to support the economic activities that are happening in the economy. So we will not print money. Elections are not one of those conditions under which the Bank of Zambia will supply money into the, into the economy. It's not a commerce activity. It's not, it doesn't bring in any productivity. It's a constitutional requirement. It's not a commerce issue. So Bank of Zambia will not participate in that in terms of looking at money supply from a point of view of an election event. And I hope this, this, this answer puts this matter to bed because it's been coming up all over the place. We will not print money for the sake of an election. We will print money at any given time in point as long as it's supported by commerce and trade. 
in order to ensure that the market is functioning, the economic activities are functioning and are being funded. That's the only time, that, that's the only criteria that we use to determine what to do with the economy. So if you look at what we've done, what is the 10 billion medium term, targeted medium term financing? We have realized that businesses are in distress. We have realized that they've got cash flow issues. And hence the reason why we've provided a cheaper facility in order for business to tap into it so that they can, they can resurrect their businesses or defend their businesses or maintain their businesses given the COVID uh, pandemic impact. The other way of looking at it is if we did nothing, what is going to happen is that these businesses will close. And once these businesses close, the economic activity of the country contracts. And once the economic activity of the country contracts, your GDP goes down, which means the country goes into serious recession, which will be more painful than trying to support these businesses to come out of where they are currently and give them whatever support we can to ensure that they, they resurrect and they're able to function pro uh, profitably, which would then in turn contribute to the future growth of our economy. So those are the, those are the conditions under which we, we look for help. But certainly, election financing is not one of them. Taonga, you talked about uh, the default if they take actions. I think if, you have, if you've been privy, the, bond, the committee of the bondholders did issue a bulletin, was it yesterday or the day before, where they did acknowledge the events that have taken place and that they will continue, they, they are willing to constructively engage. Uh, it was an elaborate um, response. But to answer your question, will Bank of Zambia pay? Bank of Zambia is a, is a banker to the government. The negotiations are taking place between the Minister of Finance and, uh, and the, 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 the creditors. And obviously, as a banker to government, which is one of the roles of uh, the central bank, yes, the government is our client. Just like if you've got an account with Atlas Mara and you've got money on your account, you can instruct your bank to pay. So we we'll await to see the evolution of the protracted discussions between the Minister of Finance and the creditors, and we'll cross the bridge when we come there. Um, money owed to commercial banks. I quite didn't understand that. Yes, perhaps <coughs> that one I can. I think. Is this is this the is this the the accounts that we opened for the commercial banks with us? I I think prudence probably you need to separate out two issues here when you talk about uh, businesses which owe the Bank of Zambia. Um, like any institution, we have business needs. So we'll buy stationery, buy other things, and these are governed by contracts and uh, under ZPPA as any other public institution is done. Um, those things run as they run. People are expected to, 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 to maintain their contacts. But in terms of the commercial banks, you see the Bank of Zambia is very unique in its relationship with the commercial banks. And these are the ones who we, because we don't lend to businesses, individual businesses. We, we get uh, services from them. But for the commercial banks, we are also actually a banker to the commercial banks. And we do lend them money in the normal course of their business. Uh, but the nature of that lending is quite special because typically for us when we lend, it is backed by some security. Um, and so when we are conducting open market operations, which the governor referred to, yes, we will give them money and then they'll pay us back. And there are particular instruments which we use to do that. So these are not really covered by a bank failing to pay us. Because if you think about it, if a financial institution fails to pay back the Bank of Zambia, then it is in significant trouble. But we're there to help financial institutions, which is what we have been trying to do in this period. So it's a bit different from the way you think about other businesses where you may need to give them um, a break because of COVID. The way we're giving them a break is to say, you need a liquidity, you had liquidity constraints, here we can help you with liquidity. Um, you needed to help your clients, here's the TMTRM. You needed to manage your clients who might have bad loans and those bad loans impact on your capital. We can give you leeway so that that capital is not hit as much, and therefore your businesses is more stable. So we're providing support to the banking sector through those mechanisms. Esnat, sorry, let me just provide you additional, and I know that there's been a lot of an ease, because I've seen it pop through in uh, the different questions that have come through on the issue of printing of money. I want to take you back to understanding 
why it's not possible. Because if you look at my presentation that I made earlier, on the inflation outlook, the future inflation outlook, we projected as Bank of Zambia <clears throat> that it would be on a decline. What we've said is that in 2021, it's expected to decline to 13.5%. And in further, in 2022 to 10%, now 2022 is past the election cycle. Now, if you print money, which is not backed by economic activity, there is no way that the Bank of Zambia could be projecting an inflation decline of 10% of in 2022. So our numbers would have shown you, support the argument of printing money without being backed, would have said that our inflation target in 2022 would be 30%. Because bringing money which is not backed by commerce pushes inflation up to a point of hyperinflation. So I think our projections in themselves as a central bank of where we see inflation going is talking to you about the measures which we're not seeing uh, excess liquidity or unconventional liquidity hitting the market to the extent where we get into a hyperinflationary environment. So, so I think our numbers talk to themselves that 2021, 13.5% inflation projection, 2022, way outside the election cycle, 10% which is signaling to you that the bank is looking at control, managing the inflation downwards. Printing of money by contrast will be managing inflation upwards. So I think that if you, if you, get it, if you do a detailed analysis in terms of a presentation, you will see that there's no scope for uh, unconventional means of printing money. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Good morning, Governor. My name is Nancy Mwambe from the Zambia Daily Mail. I want to draw you back to the issue of date. Given the precocious uh, situation that the country is in, um, what strategy does the central bank have in terms of uh, building reserve in the immediate term? And also, uh, if you look at um, the relief that we are looking at, so far we've had uh, 110 million given from China. And in terms of principal payment to the euro, we are looking at 42. In total, how much are we looking at in terms of saving if we're given that window of relief? Thank you. Governor, you just talked about the issue of uh, printing money and that uh, 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 the situations in, in which that can be done. And I, I was thinking this is coming up because of continued insinuations that there will be laxity in monetary policy after you took the position, despite your good track record, some people still think you come from a political background and there will be laxity in monetary policy. What assurance can you give to guarantee that uh, there will be no laxity? I think, Chris, let me answer your question first before I come to the other one. Understand that Bank of Zambia is an institution. Bank of Zambia is not in Vunga. Bank of Zambia has got systems, structures, guidelines, procedures, adherence to best international practice. So don't confuse myself with the institution. I'm just heading the institution, and the institution is bigger than me. So there are rules in which the bank operates. <clears throat> there are guidelines in which the bank operates. The bank is a member of international institutions. Zambia is a member of the international institutions, such as the IMF, the World Bank. So there are all these institutions that are seeing what is happening. We subscribe to, we're a member of the Bank of International Settlements. We're a member of all these numerous, we're a, member of, we're a board member of Africa, Exim Bank, we're a member of all these, these other institutions. I don't think they'll sit back and just watch the Bank of Zambia perform recklessly because of an individual. So, so I, don't see, I don't see any issue myself. It's a perception, and I would urge all stakeholders that for the benefit of the country, keep politics away from the central bank. Our job is a professional job. It's not a political job. The people working for the central bank are highly trained individuals, professionals, who I'm sure, through their ethical belief, will walk away if you're asking them to do something which is illegitimate. Secondly, appointments to a public office, like any other office, attract criticism, both constructive, non-constructive, and detractors. So it is not unusual for my appointment to be criticized. 
it is expected when you're going into a public uh, office. So I'm neither moved myself, nor fenced, nor disappointed. It's expected. It's a public office ap appointment, and it's and subject to scrutiny, and different people will view it differently. As much as you may say there's so many people that have criticized me, I can equally say there's so many people that have overwhelmingly supported me. So my job is not to worry about who's criticized me. It's the nature of the position. You will be criticized, even for the decisions we're making today. There will be other economists that would think we should have done otherwise. There are other, other people that would think we're in a democratic dispensation. So I'm not worried myself. I think my key focus is to ensure that we drive this country to economic uh, stability. That is my key focus. So I do listen to criticism. And I do, it's up to me to vet which one is constructive, which one is non-constructive. With regard to compromising the central bank, I've worked in international institutions myself, and I know the standards that are required to operate a central bank. So there's no way that I'll compromise the central bank for expediency purposes. I hope that clears the air on that matter. Uh, issue. Sorry. Governor, perhaps I should just make the point. This is, this is not the first time we're having an election. And I know this always comes up as, as an issue, but it's not the first time we're having an election. I think if you go back in history, I don't think you'll find that uh, in Zambia when we have elections, we move to a hyperinflation situation. It doesn't happen. So I think people should also look at the history. What has happened, um, you know, at least in the recent elections we've had, we've, we've not really had this issue, although people complain. Uh, we have our director at one point of, of bank supervision who was accused of importing I don't know how he was going to import it, but millions <laughs> of kwacha for the election. So these stories are always there. But I think we should be objective and look at what's happened in the past. Uh, I don't think this has been an issue. And really, we don't see why it should be an issue uh, now. I just, I just thought I'd make that. Thank you. Nancy had a question on the yes, bu building of reserves. I think, Nancy, we, we did cover that in the presentation where we talked about well, one of the key areas, and we are intensifying that, and it's eminent. Uh, it's really the gold purchases. Uh, they, we will continue with a normal uh, build-up of reserves through open market operations. When the market conditions are such that the Bank of Zambia can go into the market and buy dollars to place into reserves, that will continue as business as usual. Uh, running parallel to that, we're trying to move as fast as possible to get into the gold bullion purchase program. Um, without, I think we're very, very, very close to that. I think before the end of the year, we'll see some definite results in terms of our accumulation of gold bullion. As I said, and the Deputy Governor Operations mentioned, the, con the, the legal contracts are at the final stage. And once those contracts have been signed, then we'll be able to move. So the negotiations that are currently op are going on and uh, we should be able to sign any time soon. So we'll, we'll actually, it won't be talk, talk, talk. I think you'll see something happening pretty soon. And that should give you that level of confidence that we're building reserves both from open market, market operations and from the bullion side. And it should give us some, it should give us some form of uh, security that uh, we've got other avenues of building reserves other than open market operations. Um, you did talk about DSSI and the 42 million. Now, the, the, the conversations on debt and the DSSI, just be mindful that the debt profile is complex. There's bilateral debt, there's, there's private debt, there's commercial debt, there's all kind of debt. Minister of Finance is working on those details, and they'll be working, they'll, they'll provide guidance on how they're going to appro approach each category of debt and what the ultimate number will be after the negotiations of the relief and how the debt profile will look going forward after the DC, DSSI. So I think that information will be provided pretty soon when uh, I know the Minister of Finance are working on that. I right, thank you. Governor, before we leave this session, we have uh, two questions from our online audience. And uh, this is Dennis Mulenga. He is saying, can you clarify whether the Bank of Zambia intervention to slow the depreciation was by issuing the $112 million in the economy by drawing from reserves? The second question he's asking, he says, how sustainable is the use of reserves in trying to hold the quota? All right. I, I think let's just understand where, <clears throat> where it's coming from. 
our intervention into the market is beyond $112 million. And I think the Deputy Governor did explain that uh, we've got reserves and then we've got money we are receiving in dollars as a central bank, i.e. the mineral royalty tax gets paid to us in dollars. And we've got an option of whether to place those funds in building up reserves or push them back into the market. So, so, it's, so reserves are not the so. If anything, result, reserves are the last resort. When we touch reserves, it means we fail to touch anything else. So principally, we've got flows that are coming in. We've got statutory payments that are coming in from the mines in dollars. We've got mineral road tax that's coming in from the mines in dollars. And then we decide what portion of that will be allocated to building up the reserves, what portion of that should be released back into the market. So that's how our interventions have been taking place. So it's, so it's, so it's not the reduction between the 1.4 in reserves to the 1.3 that has, that, that has gone to market support. We've actually done, what's the total? The figure is much higher than that. It's much higher. We did, we did uh, I think, about 70 million last month. Yeah, so, so, month, so, it's so, so it's much higher than 112 million. So we're funding those flows. With market interventions are mostly from other sources of uh, dollar inflows that we're getting in. Uh, can you defend the currency from reserves? Certainly not. You can't defend the currency from reserves because uh, you run it down. So it's a combination of all these multiple interventions that we've got. And as I said, if we touch reserves, then it's a last resort. So uh, we are not sitting and defending the currency from a reserves position. There are other inflows that are coming through. At this point, since there are no further questions, let me take this opportunity to thank you all for attending our briefing. I will ask that even as we allow for the governor to leave the auditorium, we remain seated. The presentations will be shared electronically, but we do have hard copies um, just outside the auditorium. Please feel free to pick copies. And so I will invite the high table to leave the auditorium. Thank you very much.